Uh, before I begin, um, I'm just going to let you know there are going to be some spots that I going to have to fast forward through. I try to under, honor your time as best that I can, but I do think that there's definitely some significance and, and importance about this subject. First, I'd like to thank um, Dr. McElhaney, Dr. Uglo for um, having me uh, be a part of this lecture series. This is music that I love. It is music that has much importance. So I will begin to tell you a little bit about the Civil War. I'll keep my clicker in this hand, that way I can go from one thing to the next. The music really can be um, segmented into three distinct parts. The first part, or the early years, tend to be music that was more nationalistic. And, middle, and music of the middle year tend to be more about death and the loss of life. And the music of the final years tended to be more about homecoming or more about this well, the war being over and loved ones being reunited. So it's important that it, music can be divided into those three segments. Um, first, I will focus on uh, several distinct uh, pieces that are very important. I think they're trying to make sure this uh, gets up, but the importance of it, there's several pieces. The first piece that we're gonna talk about is the Battle Hymn of the Republic. The second piece that we will discuss will be Dixieland. And final, the next piece we'll discuss is Battle Cry of Freedom. And uh, those three pieces are very significant to the North and very significant to the South. Um, and we will conclude this with talking about uh, music of African Americans. A lot of times this uh, particular segment is more or less uh, left out of history, but there is real importance in, not, in understanding the culture of our society and the society of the South, and pretty much the society of the North uh, with stereotypes that have been formed by Northerners until they're finally confronted with what I like to term, with quotation, authentic blackness once they are fighting and they come to the South. I like to open, oh wow, that's loud. <laughs> I like to open this up. The light's a bit bad, so I'm going to be paraphrasing a lot of this. I had some direct quotes I wanted to talk about. But Battle Hymn of the Republic was first known um, as John Brown's Body. And I've noticed that I've labeled this John Brown's Body's Lay a Motoring in the Grave. It's important to know that there were several versions that of, of John Brown's body. Of course, if, in knowing who John Brown was, we know that he was an abolitionist uh, who was hanged in, uh, um, in Virginia. But it's important also to notice that we some might see this as a failure. He was not um, able to achieve his task. But in essence, there was a real significant uh, success, and that is it caused attention. And how did it cause attention? It caused attention from the Northerners who were who even held vigils at his death. It caused them to begin to look at what was going on in the South. And these words were repeated. And not just these words, there are different words. Everyone would come out with different lyrics. And we will see this not just with John Brown's body, but also eventually into the Battle Hymn of the Republic. We can look at it with Dixie. We can look at several pieces where they would begin to change the lyrics. So we'll look at these John Brown's body live motoring in a grave, and it moves on to his soul goes marching on. There's also another John Brown's body, and this goes, he's going to be a soldier in the army of the Lord, but his, lo his soul is marching on. So we see that this is attributed to John, uh, to John Brown, and it's repeated and repeated, until finally that not only did um, we hear it with John Brown's body with just specific people, but we begin to see that African Americans begin to sing this song also, even in the South. I wanted to make sure that I captured one of these for you because this was known as maybe the national anthem of um, the black soldiers during this particular time. So I know you're looking at this and you're wondering, did I use spell check? And the answer is actually, yes, Lee, I did. So. I will read this for you. Oh, we're the bully soldiers of the first of Arkansas. We're fighting for the union. We are fighting for the law. We can hit a rebel further than a white man ever saw as we go marching on. So we would see that 
These, these are different words, but they're sung to the same melody. And this is something that eventually doesn't just happen with colored regiments or black regiments, but it's also happening in the North and in the South. Of course, my esteemed colleague talked about uh, Julia Ward Hall, so I'm not going to inundate you with more, more facts about her, but it's important to know that in, um, uh, December of 1861, it, of course it was published, and there were still people still trying to write words behind uh, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, but her words are the ones that have rang true. They're the words that we are still using today. And I think it's important that we actually look at the words and that you actually have a chance to hear what it sounds like. One thing I've noticed is that a lot of times these older songs that are about wars that happen um, years and decades and centuries ago, we tend to forget, but it's important to, to reach back and to look uh, at this tune. It's important to look at the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Because of time, I'm only going to do one verse with a chorus, but let's look at the words. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He's trampling out the ventures where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth goes marching on. Glory, hallelujah, his truth goes marching on. So we're going to take a quick listen to this. I should have a clip back there. Yes. Drag it back. There we go. course. So if you've never got a chance to hear about O'Hare on the Republic, there it is for you. So let's move farther into this. If we can attribute John Brown's um, body and Battle Hymn of the Republic, these were songs that were songs of the North. What's important to notice is that we find the root of it in the South, but it was adopted in the North. What's even greater is that when we listen to the song that becomes the anthem of the South, finds its root in the north, in um, New York. So this is the song we're going to talk about, which is Dixieland. Uh, it was a very popular song, and it was a song that became the unofficial anthem of the South. Um, what's even more important of how it finds its more of a root, it was a song that was met, written as a minstrel song. And for our, our minstrel show, for those of you who do not know what a minstrel show is, uh, it is a show in which blacks or African Americans are depicted in a very um, dehumanizing way. It's said that they're lazy, that they're silly, that they're musical buffoons. We know that this is just a stereotype that they're trying to perpetuate, but this is uh, was not accurate, but this is how they were able to sell tickets to the show. So. What happens when you see this, then you think that this is a norm. How were they were able to achieve this where they took black cork 
and they would rub their face until it was all colored black and they were dressed in clothing that would uh, dehumanize or be able to talk with such a jargon that it showed blacks in such a negative light. So it's important to understand that this is, this is what was going on. And of course, there's many songs that are written by minstrels, My Old Kentucky Home, Oh Susanna, just to name just a few that are, are these minstrels' melodies. So Daniel Emmett was basically commissioned by his friend, Daniel Bryant, in which Daniel Bryant of the Daniel Bryant Minstrels was commissioned to write this song that he needed one day. So he went home and he came up with this tune, and of course he gave it to, um, gave it to um, Emmett, gave it to Bryant, and all of a sudden it became a hit. This song, I Wish I Was in Dixie. So let's look a little bit at the words. I wish I was in the land of cotton. Old time dare, I'm not forgotten. Look away, look away, look away, Dixie land. In Dixie where I was where I was born in, early one frosty morning. Look away, look away, look away, Dixie land. Then I wish I was in Dixie. Hooray, hooray. In Dixie land, I'll take my stand to live and die in Dixie. Away, away, away down south in Dixie. So we're going to play just a clip of this song so you can hear exactly what it sounds like, the anthem of the south. I wish I was in the land of cotton. Old times out, I'm not forgotten. Look away, look away, look away, Dixie land. In Dixieland, where I was born in early on, one frosty morning, look away, look away, look away, Dixieland. Now wish I was in Dixie, hooray, hooray. In Dixieland, there's a bright dance in it, and I'm Dixie, away, away, away down south in Dixie, away, away, away down south in Dixie. So it's important that way down south in Dixie, um, Emmett wrote this song, and it's important to keep in mind that, believe it or not, that Emmett was a starch uh, unionist. And his friend makes a, an account to him that basically says this, I was down south and I noticed that I could hear Confederate bands playing Dixie. They have seemed to have adopted it as, our, as, as their own anthem. And of course, Emin, understanding what is happening in the South, makes comments on this and says, basically, if I knew at what lengths they were going to use my song, I would have never written it. So Emmett being, uh, there's, a, there's a huge disconnect that seems that I will write this music if we were understanding that this is only a stereotype in the North, but understanding that in the South, we have um, all kind of atrocities that are happening to blacks, and he does not want to have anything to do with that. But the, the South adopts it, even though this is taking place. Um, not just the South loves Dixie, but we do have an account that many Northerns, even our president during the time, Abraham Lincoln, loved Dixie. And he makes this account, and I'm going to try to read in this, dim, in this dim light. This was written in April 10th, 1865. He said this, I have always thought Dixie one of the best tunes I have ever heard. Our adversaries over the way attempted to appropriate it, but I wished, I wished yesterday that we had fairly captured it. I presented the question to the Attorney General, and he gave his legal opinion. That is, our lawful prize. I now request the band, band favor me with this performance. One thing that Lincoln understood, and that was the political power of music. He was attempting to take Dixie and reunite the South and the North. But what happened four days later, Lincoln was assassinated. So it's important to know that Emmett, however, died in 1904. And this is something that happens a lot. Of course, happen, dying happens a lot, happens every day. <laughs> in 1904 is when Emmett died. There were 37 composers who had claimed to have written Dixie. 
Of course, we know that that wouldn't happen today because of copyright and rules and regulations. They have kind of put a stop to that. But even during the, the dates of the Civil War from basically 1860 to 1866, there were 39 different instrumental and vocal copies of Dixie uh, in existence. Some of them maintained the minstrel fa uh, flair, but there was others that, uh, like Dixie War Song, that took on more of a formal setting of the tune. Um, as the, um, the South is succeeding from the Union, uh, they are beginning to come up with other songs that they can identify with, with this movement. I'm only going to talk about a few. Understand that they, there were many, many songs written uh, in this particular time. I'm hoping that after this lecture that you would take time to begin to investigate for yourself and see that there, there were so many tunes that were written and find out what's there. What I would like to do is talk a little bit about songs uh, from the secession. One of the most popular and uh, widely sung songs was the Bunny Blue Flag. What's important to know about this song, and there was an account about General Butler's army when they occupied New Orleans. Uh, what happened was they cap uh, General Butler captured its um, publisher, uh, whose name is A.E. Blackmore, fined him $500, and then, if that wasn't enough, if anyone was caught singing, whistling, or playing the bunny blue flag, they were going to be fined $25. So there's censorship for you. So, <laughs> so let's, talk, let's look at a, a few more tunes that were happening during this time. There was also the flag of our uh, succession, What's important about this song, it was sung to the melody of the Star Spangled Banner. Also, the flag of the Free Eleven, the Stars of Our Banner, the flag of the South, the Confederate flag, and finally, farewell forever to the Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> so we talked a little bit about music of the North, and we've talked about music of the South, or uh, two very specific songs. I would like to uh, bring one more song from the North Ford that everyone should know. And this, to me, this is more of a unifying song. And this song was by George F. Root. The song was simply Battle Cry of Freedom. This song has been given, uh, has been given the, the account that it actually turned the war. This tune right here. And it was after Lincoln had asked for about 300 volunteers to, for the, to sign up for uh, the draft. And upon Roots hearing this request, he went home and he came up with this tune. And I like to read his actual account of coming up with this tune. Admittedly, a song started in my mind, words and music together. Yes, we will rally around the fag, boys. We will rally again, shouting the battle cry of freedom. I thought it out that afternoon and wrote it. The next morning at the store, the ink was hardly dry when the Lombard brothers, uh, the great singers of the war, came in for something to sing. At the war meeting that was being holden immediately in the courthouse, just off site, they went through the, and sang it once and hastened to the steps of the courthouse, followed by a crowd that had gathered while they were practicing, while practicing was going on. The jewel's magnificent voice gave out the song and Frank's trumpet tones led the refrain, the union forever, hurrah boys, hurrah. And at the fourth verse, a thousand voices were joining in the chorus. From there, the song went to the army and to the to my testimony in regard to its own in the camp and to the march and even to the field of battle from the soldiers and the army uh, officers up to the generals and devout it and finally to our good president himself made me thankful that if I could not shoulder a musket in defense of my country, I could serve her in this way. So even there, that's how Emmett felt about this song. 
the words, yes, we will rally around the flag, boys, we will rally once again, shouting the battle cry of freedom. We will rally from the hillside, we will gather from the plain, shouting the battle cry of freedom. The union forever, hurrah, boys, hurrah. Down with the traitor, up with the star, we will rally around the flag, boys, rally once again, shouting the battle cry of freedom. So even with this, I will tell you a, a, a brief, quick story of there was a Union troops that had been uh, captured and being captured, they were visited by General Lee. So you know that these were officers, important men, and they were asked to sing some of their Union songs. When they were captured, they sang songs like "Battle Hymn of the Republic," "John Brown's Body," "We're Coming," "We're Coming," "Father Abraham," "Tramp, Tramp, Tramp," "The Boys Are Marching." And finally, they sang, we'll rally around the flag, boys, we'll rally once again. After there was much exclaim and clapping of hands, finally a major stood forward, and he pretty much said these words. Gentlemen, if we had your songs, we would have whipped you at your boots. <laughs> so these are the important songs during this particular time and between this and this particular area. Uh, now, I, I want to jump forward just a little bit, and I want to go to music of African, Amer uh, African Americans that was happening during this time, and especially, even more importantly, music that is happening in the South. Um, when we think about music of African Americans, we have to think about music that's not necessarily all African, in which when we think of African music, we think of music that is extremely complex uh, with poly cross rhythms, uh, polyrhythms and cross rhythms. It's music that has its own language or a drum language, should we use this. But it's not music that is also uh, all European with the structures and how uh, the forms that we use. We can think that it is a blending of both styles. And with this blending of both styles, we get music that is truly unique music that we can kind of call our own. So with this, we can think about the music is syncopated, and for those of you who do not know what syncopated is, if you're pat patting your foot on the ground, it's when your foot actually comes up in the air. We call this the upbeat, or else we can say that it's more or less syncopated. So this is, if you're trying to draw a connection, there it is for you. And also we can think of that it's not a real strict formal a form, that it's more loose. It allows for improvisation. It allows for embellishment. So it's important to understand that within African music in the South, that this is more or less the style, the style that is going on. It's important also to know that Confederate soldiers who, who are, uh, not Confederate soldiers, Union soldiers who are moving from the North to the South are finally confronted with slavery, and they're also confronted with music. So they're realizing that the minstrel shows that had depicted blacks in such a way was not actually accurate. They're understanding the seriousness of the music making that is going on. And there comes a tradition that is not very well known in America at this time, but it is an older form, and this serious tradition can be simply known as call and response. Call and response. Now, comes for the most, to me, the most important part of this lecture, this is audience participation, because I know you have been sitting here for a while listening to me ramble on, but this important rambling. So, we're gonna do call and response. The reason I'm doing this, call and response is an oral tradition, which means that 
you don't have the music written down, you have to learn it audibly. So therefore, you are going to help me, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay, and the reason I'm saying this because I am going out on a limb because I am not a vocalist. I play trombone. But I am willing to put myself out and act as the leader. And what I'm going to sing is, when Israel was in Egypt land, you're going to say, let my people. Wow, you guys are great. So, <laughs> so we're going to enact what may have taken place at maybe a camp of maybe colored regiment soldiers, what would have taken place. But if within that music making also, of something that we're probably not going to do here is something that I love to talk about, and that is shout. This is not you just screaming as loud as you can. Shouting basically is a rhythmic dance that happens when um, that comes from a Western African heritage, and it's basically a circle, and usually there's one person in the circle, and that person begins to move as the spirit is moving in him. So it's something that happened. It is, it is something that still happens in African-American churches a lot, and even more churches It's beginning that we see that shouting is, it takes place. It was, so it's important to know that that's happening. But what we're going to focus on right now is call and response. So with this, I'm going to start off when Moses was there, and you're going to say, let my people go, and that all, we're all going to sing. Are we ready? Yeah. No laughing. <laughs> Here we go. When Moses was, when Israel was in Egypt land, oppressed so hard they could not stand. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt land, tell Yourself a round of applause. Great. I am getting, I'm getting closer and closer to the end of this. There, there's so much more. I want to talk a little bit about Frederick Douglass, but you did such a wonderful job, Diane. I'm just going to let it stay there. What I do want you to understand that this, that there was music making that was going on. There was music. Um, that is of great importance. There is music that is tied to everyone's heritage here. So it, 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 you should go out and investigate and to see what's out there. Research for yourself, see what songs I didn't cover and find the stories behind those songs. I've enjoyed speaking for you today and I'll turn it back over to your, 